welcome everyone. So uh, this is a pleasure to have you uh, uh, with us this morning. We are having, as every week, our, our, our coffee chat uh, dedicated to the extractive industries and, and especially issues of above the ground risk, license to operate, and so on. And today I have the distinguished pleasure to uh, have with me Reg Manas. So uh, I mean, Reg is a seasoned veteran of the uh, energy industry and also mining industry. More importantly, we have a lot of friends in common with Reg. Yes. So I can't, I, you know, I, I realized that from Harry Vredenberg from the University of Calgary, where I taught to uh, our friends, Lisa Sachs at Columbia University, which is probably the best friends we have. And we have a heard in common, so that, that's wonderful. Indeed. And, and uh, we're going to be able to discuss uh, today specifically about, you know, issues of social license to operate in the energy sector, trying to look at, you know, governmental relations, looking at different variable, whether geopolitical, whether is other, other series of, of international variables, how they impact situation of social license to operate uh, in, the, in the local uh, surrounding or in the immediate vicinity of the, of the mines uh, or, or the energy uh, projects. Obviously, um, as we were mentioning, most of the risks should be targeted at the local level, understood at the local level, but there are always impacts from the international situation and, 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 and especially in, in uh, projects that might be close to a, to, to a frontier or, or to a specific uh, area of conflict. Here's the, what I'm supposed to be reading and still I'm going to have the distinguished, you know, the terrible French accent is not going to help there. But anyway, the opinions expressed by today's panelists are their personal views and may not reflect the views of the organizations that they represent. Whenever possible, AMI has verified the accuracy of the information provided by third parties but does not under any circumstances, like any circumstances, accept responsibility for any inaccuracies should they remain verified. It is expected that webinar attendees will use the information provided in this webinar in conjunction with other information and with some management practices. AMI therefore will not assume responsibility for commercial loss due to business decisions made based on the use or non-use of the invitation provided in today's webinar. So basically the good thing about those different lines is that I know we already done the most boring part of this talk. <laughs> I can promise you that, you know, Reg and I are going to make that a little more entertaining and interesting. I hope so, Reg. I really can't. I hope so. Um, I had, you know, I was uh, maybe to start, you know, I was struggling to try to list all the countries where you actually operated. You have a very strong experience in, in Africa, you know, from, you know, Sudan to Senegal, uh, a little bit also in a, in a series of other countries that you might want to list. Uh, there's the Middle East, Iraq. I know you were you, you worked quite quite a bit there in the Americas, Suriname, Colombia, Peru. Would you be you know kind enough maybe to to make your own introduction maybe and and just sure. explain where are the the countries where you probably think are, are the most interesting to mention today? Explain your talisman energy, cosmos energy. Uh, please do share with us you know uh, who you are. That'd be great. Yeah. No. Thank you. Uh, and, and to begin with, Remy, thank you very much for the uh, the opportunity to have a coffee chat with you. Uh, it's a really nice chance to, uh, to, uh, to chat and uh, share some of my experiences and, and hopefully we'll have a, a lively conversation. I've had lots of interesting experiences, lots of good stories. Uh, maybe we can get into some of that. But yeah, by way of introduction. We, we, so, we, have, we can have regular coffee chats, you and I. I mean, well, the fact that people are listening to us is not a thing, but please. <laughs> in, the, in the era of COVID, you know, we, we have more than enough time stuck in our homes. So if, if that, uh, that works for you, it works for me. So. Um, yeah, so by way of introduction, so my name is Reg Manhas, and, uh, um, you know, I've had a, a 30 year career, you know, in the extractive sector, oil and gas, really, to, 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 to be more specific. I mean, I started my career actually as an engineer, um, I, a chemical engineering degree from the University of British Columbia. I work in the upstream oil and gas business as, a, as a, a petroleum engineer for a few years, long enough to get my PNG designation and my license, and I went back to law school. Then uh, worked at a major Canadian law firm for a few years, and then moved in-house to Talisman Energy in 1997 um, into their legal department. And at the time, Talisman was really growing by leaps and bounds. It was a former BP Canada. Uh, they had just kind of gone public, and the CEO had a vision of becoming, you know, um, one of the preeminent, you know, international players based out of Canada. And uh, so I joined them. I was there 15 years uh, on an amazing ride, you know, a rocket ship in terms of the, the countries and the growth that uh, we, we experienced. Um, so I began my career there doing a lot of M&A work, uh, legal work, et cetera, legal compliance type work. Um, but I got involved in a project over in Sudan in 1998, I guess it was when we first got into the, the project in terms of the due diligence and acquisition work I did. And... Uh, you know, that project uh, turned into an absolute um, nightmare, I guess you could say, from a um, above ground risk 
perspective, from a, from a reputation perspective, from a legal perspective. I mean, there's case studies written about Talisman in Sudan. I'm sure they're, they're still being studied in business schools. Um, but in any event, uh, the company went through a very difficult period where it was, it was under a lot of attack from uh, international NGOs, human rights NGOs, uh, by the US government, um, by the Canadian government. And in fact, I was asked by our CEO to jump in and create a corporate affairs function to kind of address those issues. It was 19, it actually was in 2000 when that began. And at the point that there, was, there really wasn't much in terms of um, experience within the company to deal with these issues, um, you know, community relations issues, socialized to operate, uh, human rights issues, and the broader geopolitical issues. Um, I won't get into all the details of that, but basically that's where I began to, to jump into this area. Um, over the years, we took the experience from Sudan after we left that country in 2003 and applied the learnings in terms of our above ground risk management approach, both in terms of identifying risk and then managing risks uh, as the company began aggressively moving around the world. And so, you know, my team kind of led the way in terms of Talisman's entries into Colombia in the early 2000s, into Peru in the early 2000s, um, into uh, Northern Iraq, the Kurdish region of Northern Iraq, where there was all sorts of geopolitical issues, of course. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of Southeast Asia as well, uh, Remy, not so relevant for this uh, audience, but you know, a lot of work, I, a lot of time I spent in Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea. Um, talk about geopolitical issues. We were dealing with the Chinese embassies and the Chinese consulates, you know, trying to run seismic in the South China Sea on the Vietnamese side of the, uh, the waters where you know, Chinese quote unquote fishing vessels would come and cut your seismic lines. And so you know, there, there was, a, it was a pretty interesting time at Talisman. Um, I then left Talisman, uh, I should back up also to say that um, my last couple of years at Talisman, I moved into the domestic side of the business, um, basically trying to apply the learnings that we had taken from the international side of the business in terms of how to approach community relations, how to um, approach stakeholder relations, government relations, and things around transparency, and apply those to the shale business, which was really beginning to grow. This would have been 2009, 2010 when Talisman was the biggest player in the Marcellus Shale up in Pennsylvania and York, as well as Eagleford and Houston, uh, you know, in Texas, and uh, even some shale work in Poland, and certainly work in, in um, you know, Northeast British Columbia in Canada. Um, so I did that for a couple of years, and, uh, and then eventually um, moved to, down to Dallas, packed up the family from Calgary and moved to Dallas, Texas in 2012 to help Cosmos Energy build its external affairs function. And, and uh, you know, the, the main focus of my work to begin with was really to help them develop their set of business principles, their kind of systems approach to stakeholder relations and human rights and transparency, um, and apply those in a, in a really proactive way, beginning with the, the company's really controversial exploration program, Offshore Western Sahara. You know, very complicated, non-self-governing territory, disputed between Morocco and Algeria, you know, under kinds of uh, UN sanctions, et cetera. So really try to apply our learnings in a very proactive way and really bring, bring best practice to the ground um, and really uh, engage with stakeholders in a way that probably had never been done uh, in that territory because of the concerns the Moroccan government had, et cetera. So that was really a, a you know, second in a lifetime project. I guess you could say Sudan was first in a lifetime and uh, you know, Western Sahara was again, you know, just unbelievably uh, cutting edge. Uh, but you know, beyond that at, at Cosmos, you know, we were very active that, you know, offshore deep water explorer, um, mainly offshore Africa. So, you know, the work I had then encompassed our, our uh, programs, uh, offshore Mauritania, offshore Senegal, uh, a lot of work with respect to our existing production in Ghana, uh, a lot of work my last couple of years at uh, Cosmos with respect to exploration offshore Sao Tome and Principe, uh, mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful islands. Uh, yes. And, um, and also in South America, back to South America in Suriname, where uh, Cosmos has drilled a, a couple of wells. And uh, I'm watching with interest as Apache and Total have had great success kind of in adjacent blocks to uh, Cosmos. So the great hope has always been that the Guyana discoveries would find their way into, into Suriname. And it's very exciting to see for the, for Surinamese, uh, for Statsoli and others that there is, you know, this success. So I wish them all the best in, in terms of that. So, um, you know, I've had a pretty broad experience. I think I've worked on, you know, I've had meetings, I've had engagements on virtually every ter uh, continent in the world, save uh, Antarctica, um, with, with uh, you know, pretty deep, pretty rich experiences. And, uh, 
I'm, I'm now on my own. I left Cosmos uh, at the end of the year, uh, thankfully before the carnage in the energy sector. So my timing was good. And my intention has been to set up a practice and, you know, provide some advisory services to not only energy companies, but mining companies and others who are all grappling with these same kinds of above ground issues and stakeholder relations and the, the convergence of geopolitics and local issues, uh, et cetera. Well, you, you're not entirely in your, on your own since you, you're part of the, the, the broader AMI, AFMI galaxy of friends, and we, we, we're more than happy to Fantastic. work with you on a regular basis. I mean, obviously, uh, this, uh, and, and I will probably ask you, although you actually explained a lot of your credentials in the past, I know you worked a little bit also on, on mining projects, and you're currently still working on, on some of the mining projects, so I might want to, to ask you a little bit about this. Obviously, having you on board here is part of, you know, we're as I mentioned several times on this coffee chat, we're opening African market intelligence and, yeah. and your experience in, in series of those countries really is kind of complementary to the 36 countries in Africa where, where we operate uh, today. I, I, I love the, the, the team spirit that we can have and talking about team spirit kind of transition. I just wanted to introduce very quickly Arthur Dakin, which some of you already know. So Arthur, if you want to say hi. <laughs> that'd be, hey that'd guys. Be um, yeah. yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Remy. It's very likely that I might take a week of vacation in August. And so that doesn't mean that my, my coffee chat will be ended, but Arthur will be, uh, you know, just doing a much better job than I do very quickly. I will have to step up my game when I come back to make sure I'm up to his standards. Uh, but our idea, obviously, is to try to, to, to discuss with you. Sorry, that's my dog in the background. You can probably hear. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably my kids in front of are also going to come one day. But anyway, uh, the, the, the idea here for us is try to see, and maybe if you want to, to, to expand on your experience in, in, in the mining sector, um, I think specifically in Mauritania or, or other countries, uh, and, and try to see specifically maybe the differences according to you between the mining sector and the energy sector. Uh, we, we've done a lot of work on, on white paper on, on mining, uh, about the ground risk in mining. We're doing the same right now in energy, and that's why we're collaborating also with you, Reg, on those yeah. topics. What is, according to you, uh, you know, the, the key differences between mining and energy in the way that they address uh, you know, social license to operate, geopolitical risk, and others? There's a lot of them to pick from, but can you pick one or two and just explain us a little bit how, how you see this? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I don't have any direct experience working on mining projects per se, but I have had a lot of interaction with other mining companies um, in areas where either Talisman or Cosmos had operations. And, you know, there's just always a lot of information to be shared, a lot of experiences to be shared um, between uh, companies, regardless of the sector. And so, you know, in Mauritania, for example, there was a lot of back and forth with, you know, the, the you know, you don't have to mention the names, but the major mining company that's working in, in, in Mauritania, um, a lot of, uh, you know, advice and, and uh, support either way between, between Cosmos and, and uh, Kinross, of course. And, uh, you know, in Suriname, you know, a lot of exchanging of information with respect to, you know, how Newmont has fared in, in Suriname. So, you know, certainly something I've always prided myself on in, in terms of my work has been, you know, engaging stakeholders across the spectrum. And, you know, that's one of the lessons I take away is, you know, you cannot have tunnel vision when it comes to your you know, your particular project, your particular industry, or, you know, who you deem to be the most adjacent, you know, stakeholders, you know, mm -hmm. you really need to, you know, take advantage and understand kind of the broader perspectives in, in countries like Suriname and, and, and Mauritania, where, you know, the extractive sectors are so critical. And in fact, you know, the mining sectors are, you know, precursors, you know, to oil and gas, oil and gas is new on the scene. And so the mining companies have a lot more experience, they have a lot more time on the ground, and they probably bear a lot more scars uh, in terms of what has worked, what hasn't worked. So I've always found it extremely valuable, you know, to, to spend time and, and build relationships. And I've been fortunate that, you know, my, my, my contacts, you know, span beyond just the, the energy industry. So in, in terms of the big differences, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, they're, they're, they're very different footprints, right? Especially when you think about, you know, my experience other than you know, my talisman experience, of course, Sudan was an onshore operation with all the warts of, of onshore, you know, the work in, in uh, Papua New Guinea and in Indonesia, you know, big onshore operations. But, you know, all the work at Cosmos, except for our operations in Cameroon, were all deep water offshore and all very much kind of exploration stage. And so, you know, you're just talking about a very different dynamic uh, in terms of, you know, the schedule of, of how the money gets spent you know, the certainty of your, 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 your investment um, and the amount of labor that you're able to deploy 
Um, and so the mining companies, you know, certainly have a lot more of a challenge when you, you look at, uh, you know, the big onshore operation, you know, Kinross has in, in Mauritania and the, and the issues they've had, you know, this is no secrets, the, the, the labor issues, I think they've just come to some agreements now, uh, environmental issues, the footprint is a lot uh, bigger and the, uh, the, the labor force interactions are a lot bigger and therefore the, the exposure of the company, you know, to all sorts of uh, reputation, political, stakeholder, community uh, risks is that much larger. And so, you know, I would never proclaim that we have all the answers in oil and gas because I think the mining companies are usually at the, uh, the, the, the sharper end of the spear when it comes to these kinds of issues. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the philosophy around how you manage those things is the same. I mean, I think that, you know, in, in countries like Suriname, uh, Mauritania, no matter where you are, you know, demonstrating early commitment to, to local content is really important. I mean, for Cosmos, it was always very uh, a point of pride that I think virtually all of our country managers, uh, certainly at a mature stage of, of exploration, were all national staff and certainly um, anyone below a country manager in terms of external affairs staff, uh, et cetera, were all nationals. And so, you know, whether it was in Morocco or in Mauritania, you know, Mauritania, we had a, a Mauritanian country manager right from the get go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just a very strong signal, you know, to the country. And, and then that's a strong signal to your team as well, that this is you know, something you're really committed to. So I think local content, setting the right signal right from the get go is extremely important. Um, on, on this, on, on this, maybe, and and and, yeah. and obviously, to that you can also catch your breath and get a coffee, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but I, I, obviously, we, we um, clearly there's there's differences between energy and mining, and, and they have complete different structure, both in terms of economy, in terms yeah. of of how they impact the country. We've seen, I've seen uh, Alexander uh, in our chat just saying he was from Ecuador. Ecuador is clearly a good example of a country that, unfortunately, for a long time, had a, I mean, still has now, but had a joint mining and energy ministry, and yeah. then only when you know, they actually split this, uh, did mining, you know, was able to develop its own, I mean, there was a, a work done to develop their own so fiscal policies for mining and so on. So obviously the rules are, 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 are very different. However, I mean, when, when we interact with, let's say, uh, uh, national agencies of hydrocarbons or different, you know, uh, oil company, it is true that the understanding of loss of license to operate, of reputational impact, of political risk and others is less understood in the energy sector and the mining sector is clearly much more advanced into this area. Um, have you seen maybe in your experience potentially some, some uh, you know, front actors that you know, take this, this, this fight or this understanding you know, faster or are a little more ahead of the curve on this? I know, I know Total has some very specific rules in terms of local content. Uh, I am, and I'm trying to see who are the front runners in the industry, for example, that will understand that this is not something that they can actually do without. They have really to address those above the ground risk, reputational impact, because if only on their investors or banks and others who finance those operations now are really seeing the impact of, of, not, of investing into sometimes you know, fossil fuel or projects that are not clean in terms of, of, of generation, you know, uh, of, of good relationship with communities. Yeah, I mean, I think that the energy sector, you know, it's just, it's such a broad uh, term and you've got, you know, just the mining sector, you've got junior explorers all yeah. the way to kind of mid-sized companies. Cosmos will probably be somewhere between junior and mid size, And then you've got the, 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 the super majors, the, the BP shells, Exxon's. And I have to say, I mean, my experience has been that all of those, you know, all the big boys, do a pretty good job. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you look back at each of those companies that they've all gone through some type of trauma, you know, and, and, uh, you know, they've all learned and, and, uh, you know, working with BP as Cosmos did quite a bit, obviously in Mauritania and Senegal, you know, I've done a lot of work over the years with Total, um, with Shell, you know, those companies are, are, are best in class, I think, when it comes to understanding these risks and, and putting the resources in at an early stage to build those relationships you know, do the, do the local content um, legwork, you know, the foundational work that, that will, you know, allow you to, you know, come up with a proper plan and, and really put the right things in place at an early stage. So, I mean, I think that those, those companies have all done a pretty good job. Um, you know, I think that they all have had, you know, there's controversies, you know, the industry industry is, is, is what it is. But, you know, you look at, uh, you know, for example, my, my dealings with Total, you know, I go back to, um, you know, over 20 years ago, working with Total in Colombia, yep. where, you know, the approach was a bit different, I have to say, compared to where it is today. I mean, you know, Total is now a world leader 
on human rights issues. They're a world leader on something I'm incre incredibly passionate about, which is transparency. You know, I've, I've been kind of flying the flag in terms of contract transparency and kind of fiscal transparency within the energy sector for many, many years. And Cosmos and Talisman were kind of uh, alone in the desert for, for quite a long time on those issues. But you look at what uh, Puyan has done uh, with Total, you know, really taking a forward leaning approach on those things. And so I think those kinds of tones set the, set the way um, that in terms of being leaders on the ground in, in all these spots. So I think that um, the, the other issue is, and it's the same in the mining sector, you know, when Talisman went into Peru, for example, you know, I think we, we took a best in class approach in terms of how we dealt with community issues, how we dealt with environmental issues and how we dealt with civil society, both at the local level, all the way up to the international level, whether it was Amazon Watch coming to our annual meetings or, you know, the national federations in Peru, um, voicing their, their, their concerns with respect to the industry itself. We walked into a situation in Block 64 where, you know, the brand of the energy industry was, was already tainted because of, you know, old operations uh, in Blocks 1AB, for example, and those, you know, continue to be hot spots, you know, to this day. And so, you know, companies like Total and, um, you know, BP, Cosmos can do a great job, but, but uh, you know, if there's baggage from previous operations or their, you know, the reputation from other, you know, controversy spread, it makes it really, really difficult. Um, so we all, you know, that's the nice thing about this area. There's, there's a lot of sharing of experience because there's no competitive advantage in one company stubbing their toe. No, absolutely. Yeah, share the pain. yeah we, we see this obviously. And maybe I, I, I'll turn to Arthur. I don't know if, if, if Arthur is, is in mute. We've been looking very closely at, at specifically the Guyanese Shield and, and you worked in Suriname and other. Arthur, did you want to ask a question specifically on, on, on the region? Yeah, so, um... As, as I'm sure you know, Reg, there's been a very uh, tough um, resolution to the elections, presidential elections. Guyana took almost five months for them to declare a new president, and that happened in the last few days. Um, what are your prospects for Guyana's oil and gas sector uh, in the future? Uh, do you view the new administration as positive, negative? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, to be honest, I haven't followed it as closely as you all have, but I mean, I think that uh, the fact that it took five months to resolve the, uh, the election is, is certainly very problematic. I mean, I think at this point in time, any certainty in terms of the administration uh, and, and the policies going forward can only be a positive for the industry. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that, you know, again, Exxon is obviously the big, the big player there. Um, people have very strong opinions about, about Exxon and, and uh, you know, the, their history and their approach. But, you know, you, can't, you couldn't ask for a more competent organization in terms of, you know, stewarding the industry itself uh, with respect to uh, capacity building. You know, I know the work they've been doing with um, some of their third party providers around supply chain uh, capacity building, etc. I mean, I think that the, the industry should hopefully be in decent hands in terms of how it matures uh, with some certainty in terms of the politics, um, the regulations. I know the Minister of Energy there, um, I dealt with him a bit in the past. I'm not sure if he's the same, if he's, he's sticking around, but you know, there was, um, there was a, a, a real um, sense of overwhelm you know, in, in Guyana from what I saw in, in terms of what was coming at them. I think some political stability uh, can only be a good thing going forward. I mean, and they're, they're you know, it's an embarrassment of riches of what, of what they've discovered. And so um, I, I think Exxon's full aware that the, the eyes of the world are on them in terms of how this develops. So I'm, I'm cautiously confident that the sector is going to develop in, in the right way there. What I love about the example from, from, from Guyana, but we actually I'm going to, you know, take a little distance with it, but Guyana or Suriname, we're seeing transition in terms of political power yeah. in area, in, in, in a region where you have Venezuela just next door, you have the Trump administration looking at it very closely. You have a Chinese presence, which is very strong, especially in Suriname. I don't know if people know, but Suriname is, is clearly the hub of, every, of, of a lot of Chinese infrastructure companies that have been invited by Desi Buters when he was president yep. uh, and, 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 and came to Suriname thinking that that would be their kind of headquarters for further investment in Latin America. So it's very Chinesified in terms of... of, of Incredible, of, the amount of casinos in, in uh, Paramaibo. It's uh, amazing. Amazing. And there's money laundering into it, but yeah, I won't get yeah. into this. Uh, but the, the idea is, I mean, when you look at this region, when you look at Western Sahara, where you've been very effective, when, you know, the dispute between, uh, you know, Algeria <coughs> and Morocco or Iraq, I mean, I, we have together a lot, many years of experience in the Middle East where you see these, these geopolitical forces at play. Uh, how can you have 
you know, what's, what's your advice to energy companies or mining companies that are in a situation where they have to be extremely cautious of a geopolitical, you know, balance of power, potential split, influence that it has on the project itself. How, what, what could be a, a, the right methodology or protocols that you advise to company to, uh, to implement? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the first lesson, uh, certainly I took away from my Sudan experience, I think the whole company took that lesson was, you know, don't think you're going to be able to um, have a successful project by keeping your head down. Mm -hmm. You know, head down approach um, probably never worked, but certainly in this era, it has no chance of ever working. And I think that the first thing companies need to do is understand the broader context within which they're working. Um, you know, companies choose to go to these geopolitically difficult regions. And by choosing to go, you know, you, you have a duty to your shareholders and to your, your, your operations to take a bigger picture approach, in my opinion. Um, and, and that means, you know, whether it was a talisman or cosmos, you know, when we looked at Western Sahara or we looked at Iraq, you know, Kurdish region of Iraq, the amount of front end due diligence we did and the amount of front end engagement we did with stakeholders, you know, whether it was Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Global Witness, um, but also U.S. State Department, you know, at the highest levels to make sure that A, we understand what the issues are from their perspective and B, when we're able to make it public, they understand exactly our approach and what we're doing and that there's a good channel of communication. Um, you know, I, I look back at the, uh, the Kurdish example where we entered into what was a very complicated, continues to be extremely complicated region where you've got the Kurdish regional government issuing licenses to companies, you know, um, over the objections of Baghdad, right? And you've got this constitutional battle going on. And, you know, the amount of analysis we did at the time in terms of the constitution you know, new blocks versus old blocks and what was constitutionally acceptable versus not. Um, that was one aspect of it. But the other aspect was as a Canadian company going into Iraq, you know, the U.S. government had a huge opinion and really weren't supportive of companies going into the northern region because they were worried that this was helping to destabilize and pull the country apart. And, you know, so we spent more time in D.C. I spent more time in D.C. at the State Department explaining what we were doing, you know, to the point where they, they told us, they said, look, we know you're not a U.S. company, you're not bound by our rules, but we appreciate you coming in. We appreciate the ability to give you feedback to the point that, you know, there were blocks in the region that we were being granted where if you looked at the geography, the, the blocks were actually going across that so-called green line, you know, so Ashti was trying to assert uh, sovereignty through uh, assigning licenses. And so I would take those, those license agreements before they were signed, I would take them to Washington and we would have the State Department Iraq officials look at those blocks and give us what the actual line ought to be. And then we would take that back to, uh, to Erbil and say, this is exactly what needs to be done. We're not, we're not going to be your boots on the ground, you know? And, and so I think at an early point, it's understanding the geopolitical context, not necessarily under, you know, also understanding what you can influence or what you can't influence, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're not going to be able to change the broader context of what's happening, but understanding what you can manage and then what are the residual risks that you just cannot you know, you cannot mitigate away, uh, you know, as a board director, that would be a really important thing. So I think that's on entry, understanding that context, um, engaging with st stakeholders across the reach, across the board, you know, groups that you may not think that have a, have a stake, but, you know, have, could have a big impact on your operation if you don't do it right, is really, really important. And in, in the Iraq example, you know, we pushed really hard and we were the first company to have the Kurds uh, disclose or allow us to disclose the, the, the bonus that, you know, that we were paying to enter into the country, which was you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. We had them agree that we will put the monies into a trust fund. It will only be spent for capacity building and social programs on the ground, you know, really trying to create the framework for success and understanding when you have leverage, right? You have leverage when you're first entering into the block, when, whether it's in Ecuador or whether it's in Peru or whether it's in Iraq, you know, if a large publicly traded Canadian company is looking to go into those countries, the country obviously is going to benefit from a talisman or whomever going in because they have a good reputation. Therefore, you have some leverage and you ought to be able to, you know, create the best conditions for your entry. And because once you have a discovery or you start putting capital into the ground, you know, your leverage diminishes very, very quickly. So I think it's really understanding the very stage gates that you're at, what the leverage points are, and yeah. creating that broader orbit of, of contacts that you can work with around how do you kind of create the change that you want. I obviously agree. I mean, you saw me very enthusiastic at one moment during your answer because that, that brought up the point that, that I wanted to make. I see also Stacey uh, asked a question. I just want to, I'm, I'm going to come up to that question, Stacey, don't worry, but 
I want to encourage everyone to ask any questions in the, in the chat. We want to make this as interactive and, and as, as much of use to you guys more than just the chat that we have. I'm with Reg. I'm just happy to chat anytime, but it's more interesting <laughs> for you guys. Uh, why I was so enthusiastic was when you actually mentioned groups that you didn't know how to stake. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, um, obviously the first uh, reflex or idea when you see a geopolitical impact or potential cross-border conflict is to look at it from obviously the, the, the international view and, and looking from, from geopolitics, also the, the legal argument of whether or not according to constitution, who has the right and so on. But there are so much more indirect impact in terms of what really, you know, alter your capacity to run a, a, a a profitable operation I and mean, whether it is in you know, a series of regional stakeholders actually might have a game at play especially yeah. when you might have let's say chinese influence <clears throat> or russian influence or even like a change of, of 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 regime this actually might have an impact not at the local level national level but much more at the regional level when some key actors of the business sector or key actors political actors might actually favor the arrival or the the, the growing presence of the us or china or whichever and you need to understand how this changes you know your your community relations and your stakeholder engagement level. Also, maybe on the operational level, I mean, when you look at Tanzania, for example, what happened with the smelters and the Chinese influence on the, on the smeltering, I mean, all these geopolitical impact or outside, you know, variables need then to be actually diluted down in a series of other aspects, whether it's reputational risks, economic risks, what does that mean for the country? It can actually be a positive. There's more, you know, stronger investment from China that might actually have a, a positive impact on, on, on the country, you know, budget and therefore limiting the, the, the rise of, of royalties or other of the taxation. But it really needs to be trickled down into all those different areas of above the grand risk, political risk, economic risk, and, and others. Um, turning to maybe the, the, the question from, from, from Stacy, um, you know, when you look at local content specifically, so moving from a mini, mining economy to an oil and gas economy, which you've seen in a series of, of, of countries, what are some common mistakes governments make during this transition beyond not developing a robust local content policy? If I may, I'm just going to give you, I mentioned Ecuador. Uh, I mean, the Korea administration literally took the windfall tax from the oil sector and imposed it on Kinross. Uh, that's what led to Kinross leaving the country. Uh, mm -hmm. So just thinking that it's the same thing is a common mistake. Uh, but, you know, apart from this really one-on-one -on -one level that I just gave, can you provide more expertise maybe on some other errors that governments do when they try to open up to the mining industry with a mindset which is much more turned towards fossil fuel. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you, you hit it on the head in terms of, you know, assuming one industry is applicable, you know, the rules are applicable to the other. Um, you know, I think there just needs to be a better, more nuanced understanding of the stages of, of, of business and, and, you know, what's possible. I mean, I think one of the biggest issues that I've seen within the oil and gas industry on local content is really managing expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, number one, you know, unlike mining, oil and gas just doesn't employ a lot of people, you know, and you tend to employ very high skilled um, contractors. You know, yeah. when we're drilling a well offshore, uh, somewhere offshore Africa, you know, it's not Cosmos drilling the well. It's, it's um, you know, the drill rig ship and you've got Schlumberger, you've got Halliburton, you've got, you know, all the, the subsea sevens, you've got all these unbelievably high tech global companies involved. Um, so I think, again, you know, working with local stakeholders and local regional governments to have them understand at a very early stage, you know, what you're bringing to the area, the territory, the region, and what you aren't bringing, you know, yeah. and working with that government at a very early stage to ensure that the government doesn't get over their skis either in terms of promising um, things that just cannot be delivered, right? Yeah. And working with the government at a very early stage to say, okay, here's what we think we can bring in terms of, you know, Western Sahara, it was look, we're going to put our helicopter base, you know, in, in Dakla. Uh, we're going to build the pad by the airport. We're going to build the hangar. Uh, we're going to have crew changes. We're going to have people stay at the hotels. We're going to be able to cater locally, you know, we can even bring fuel from the region. Um, but we won't, what we can't do is hire a bunch of people to go to the rig. You know, if there's an assumption why everyone can go work. Well, that doesn't work. And if the mayor or the governor starts to talk in that fashion, it's very difficult politically to walk back. And so I think really early engagement, again, you know, in terms of what's possible, what's not possible, and finding a common approach on, on how you can kind of create tangible um, evidence of your commitment to local content at an early stage. And then if you have success, again, depending on the operation, if it's LNG, you know, you're talking much more low, you know, if it's onshore, it's a much more labor intensive thing. And in Senegal, Mauritania, Cosmos and BP have done a great job in terms of setting up 
very large kind of polytechnic institutes at an early stage to try to train people, you know, not just engineers, but vocational trades and, and create that, create that kind of foundation. But uh, I think managing expectations is very, um, very, very important. Yeah, I, I think you know, Arthur has a, has a question on, on COVID and impact on, on the oil industry. But first, I, I want maybe to, to, to bring out a, a comment. That, um, we see, I mean, on, on both, both elements, you know, switching or not switching, but just using some, uh, uh, some policies or frameworks from the mining industry to the energy sector or the other way around just yeah. simply cannot work. But at the same time, some sectors are a little more advanced that, than others. So for example, issues of above the ground uh, risks, uh, community uh, relations, mining companies are more advanced than, than, than energy companies. On the other side, when you look at local content, I mean, we've been you know, looking very closely at a, at, a, at a country in Sub-Saharan Africa where there's a very large you know, uh, energy operation, a very ambitious targets from the government asking for 35 to 40% of the, you know, of the operations to be, you know, drilled into local content, which is simply not possible because the economy of the country is too small to even, you know, reach this 40% of the operation of the, uh, so it's, it's a lot about creation of local business in the long run. There's been negotiation that this should not apply for the first five years, but then later, and that becomes a work of creation of local business ecosystem. And that's something that, you know, sometimes mining company are a little bit lagging behind on understanding how to really build strong relationship with suppliers. We're right. building a very strong relationship with key, let's say, economic actors in the vicinity, let's say within 200 miles of a, of, of a project. Uh, and when I say onshore, obviously, I'm, but maybe close to it. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, having with a long-term vision, the, the idea of building with, you know, collaboration with those key economic actors, investors or others that obviously are not as strong as the energy company, but they can be actually groomed into becoming suppliers. And so this long-term version of, of building, you know, local content for the extractive industries is something that the energy sector is more advanced than the mining sector. We're happy to share best practices and Reg is definitely probably the, the best guy to do this and, and, and us also, but also, you know, understand on the other side for our energy folks that are there, you might want to look into the reputational risk, the uh, community relations, you know, protocols that the mining industry is, 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 is developing because they make a lot of sense for the energy sector. And unfortunately, if I may be very brutal and direct, the energy sector is not there yet doesn't understand those logics yet. They rule in three, four, five years, but when you or Raj or I give talk, you see the big difference between giving a talk to a mining chamber or talking to a talk to a mining, uh, to, to an energy uh, association when think, eh, yeah, that sounds cool, but it's just tree huggers. Uh, but you know, and, and then yeah. actually see that the business case is there. Arthur, maybe can you, can you, you wanted to talk about actually the, the impact of, of, of COVID and pandemics on, on the energy sector for Reg, please. Yeah, um, so a lot of people we've talked about have said that COVID and the pandemic is probably going to increase the transition into green energy and, and renewables. And the reason behind that is that fossil fuels are connected in people's minds to being a dirty fuel and dirty equals viruses, viruses equals pandemics, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the logical thought process behind it. Do you also believe that's going to happen? Do you see citizens increasing their pressures on, on governments to make that transition? And, and how do you see oil prices impacting that, that move? Yeah, I mean, that's the trillion dollar question, isn't it, Arthur, in terms of what the future looks like for, uh, you know, the price of oil and the price of that's brand. That's why you're here. I'm that, that's the only reason we invited you. you. Know <laughs> I mean, if, if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't be here. I would oh, God. I'd be on an island somewhere. You know, I would be I would be a very wealthy man. There's no doubt about it. I think that, that that's uh, what our friendship is worth to you. Gosh, I, <laughs> Go ahead, well, I, could, I could video conference you from the beach somewhere, perhaps. Exactly. But I mean, I think that there's just so much um, unknown right now in terms of where the energy business, you know, the oil and gas traditional business is, is headed. I think that there was obviously so much noise and so much pressure and so much change happening even before COVID. You know, I think that you, you saw the, the kind of uh, irresistible force was already upon the industry. And I think that, uh, you know, if you look at um, what Shell and BP and Total and others have been doing, even Cosmos, you know, before the pandemic, uh, you know, has a, a big change in terms of their climate strategy and, and, you know, kind of slowing down or stopping kind of new field exploration uh, of oil. Um, so I think the companies were already feeling the pressure. I think there was already a lot of, uh, of movement, you know, from citizenry around the world 
to this transition towards greens. And I think, you know, most importantly, I think the commercial uh, kind of competitiveness of, of solar and, and, and wind, you know, had reached the point where certainly from a grid perspective, um, you know, it was very competitive and, you know, uh, advantageous, you know, even compared to natural gas. And so I think that you were seeing this transition already happening around the world. The question was, well, how quickly can it happen and, and how quickly can the infrastructure really shift? And, you know, we're still looking at coal, I suppose, these days in terms of what China is going to do with coal. And so, you know, I think the jury is out in terms of what the actual numbers will look like in, 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 the, in the future. Um, I, do, it's, I do think it's inevitable that, that uh, you know, oil demand will, will peak and, and will, will drop. The question is, have we already hit it? I mean, people say that, you know, the, the 2019 demand was peak oil demand. I'm not sure that's true, but I guess time will, time will tell. But if you look at what BP announced, I think it was yesterday or today, you know, their, their earnings were, uh, were, were difficult, obviously, like every energy company for the second quarter, but they've announced, a, you know, a, a very big transition, you know, and, and, you know, increasing their green energy investments by tenfold over the next few years, you know, that their oil production is going to drop, They're, they've committed to no more exploration in new countries uh, for, for oil and gas. So, I mean, I think you see that trend accelerating now, and you've got companies that are feeling the pressure from shareholders um, as much as anybody else and are really trying to lean into the change and demonstrate to, you know, their stakeholders that there is a future for, for uh, the shells and the BPs. And, you know, I've got a lot of confidence that those companies will be able to make that transition. You know, they've got the capacity, they've got the technical talent, they've got the financial acumen to, to make that transition and they can do it at a scale where, you know, it, it can be very material. So in terms of oil prices, I mean, if you look at with all the talk and all the ups and downs of the market, you know, Brent has stayed above $40, you know, for the last many months and, and WTI is hanging in as well. And so, you know, it seems to me that the, the price of oil, perhaps if it stabilizes between 40 and 50 bucks, you know, it, it will present a future for, for the companies that can, can do things well. I mean, I think that for, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies up in my home country of Canada, it's certainly in the oil sands, it's going to be very difficult. And you see the write downs happening you know, based on people's projection of future oil prices. Total announced, I think, $8 billion in write downs on their oil sands projects and Shell has done similar. So I think it's gonna be, you know, the marginal price, the marginal cost of various projects will ultimately decide, you know, what remains and what, what gets, you know, not ultimately produced. But, you know, I, I, I don't see oil demand dropping, you know, even in best case scenario, you know, below, you know, 80, 85 million barrels a day for, for a long, long time. So. I think eventually you're just going to see the energy industry dominated by the NOCs, right? They're lowest cost producers. So the Saudis, the Iraqis, the uh, Kuwaitis, um, they'll be the ones kind of the last people standing. And I'm not sure what that means geopolitically for all of us. <laughs> well, that, that, that'd be the topic for potentially the next uh, coffee chat. That's, yeah. uh, that's another <laughs> big topic. But going to, your, I mean, obviously you mentioned the, 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 the shell sands and the and investment in Alberta. I'm definitely for, for Canadian actors, for European actors. I mean, we work with a couple of them and they're, yeah. They're only looking at renewable energy I and mean, the transition is clearly there. The pressure, political pressure domestically, the pressure from the population also uh, makes it that there's a clear shift, at least in terms of new investment in Latin America and new investment in Africa, uh, where you, you see definitely some of the traditional OECD players now really looking closely only at and I'm not even, I'm sometimes, you know, geothermal is sometimes a little too dark for them even. So they're looking at hydro, they're looking at sometimes hydro not understanding the complexity of having a hydro operation with, you know, movement of population and so on. But they're looking at solar, they're looking at, so even if the price point is not there yet, the, 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 uh, the incentive through investment is definitely there. There's a lot of investors that are looking to, to go there. I just want to maybe switch to uh, uh, the question from Megan. I don't have the pleasure to know Megan. That's a great question. Uh, she's asking for mining, but that could actually uh, apply to energy. And maybe you want to answer on energy and I'll do on mining. You know, energy and mining supply and service companies play a role in local procurement, obviously. Have you seen success in cases where mining slash energy, I will add it, supply and service companies establish joint ventures in host countries in order to strengthen local industry and supply capacity? I do have plenty of examples, but I'm sure in the energy sector, uh, especially potentially in Senegal, in Peru, in Colombia. I think those countries are usually more mature where you, where you work into those joint ventures. Can you maybe share with Megan and with the, the others some examples of, of, of key successes there? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, 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 the service sector is usually um, uh, at the front end of these issues because they're the ones who employ more people. We, we tend to contract out as energy companies to the service companies, uh, whether that's operations on an FPSO or fabrication yards, 
uh, or even like local local catering, et cetera. So, I mean, in Ghana, there's there's a lot of examples of where you know local local suppliers have have been brought into the project through international uh, international players. No, no, connection. I'm sure, the mining sector is even further ahead on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, de definitely the mining sector in, in Ghana. I mean, we, we, uh, I actually plan on bringing someone from, from Ghana when we work in, a, in, in the future. Uh, but what, what I find very, very interesting is, I mean, we're seeing a series of projects where sometimes even the license to operate is actually sold by a larger economic actor. I mean, I do have two, th actually three projects in mind uh, where you don't understand who's financing the opposition to the mining projects. Mm -hmm. Some people are opposed to the mining project or to the energy projects. They're not even from the region or they're just going through you know, some weird financing scheme when you actually dig into it. And you actually realize that it's a, it's a very front forward actor or large company uh, or individual that actually finances the opposition because they do not want the mining or slash energy project in that specific region. Why don't they want it? Usually because they might have an, an alternative scenario for that, that region or that specific jurisdiction, uh, or they also have a personal or, or industrial interest into supplying, you know, either the mining company or the energy company wouldn't say that it's a way to extort money or to move towards that direction, but that happens more often than not. So then suddenly, obviously, the, the building a joint venture with, you know, uh, those organizations that might have an alternative, as I said, plan for, for the region, but understand that the two projects actually can be compatible. There are plenty of ways that obviously that would, you know, limit potentially profitability of a project by going for alternative scenarios, whether in engineering and location and some others. But this kind of investment is actually much better than having this license to operate stalled for several years uh, yeah. because you were not able to, you know, find and, and break up a deal between uh, b between the, 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 the different position and, 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 and the company. And so really it's important. That's why, you know, tracking beyond the stakeholder mapping, looking at who's behind them. And so yeah. sometimes you see very unnatural fit between guerrilla members and very right wing so, you know, financiers that have an interest of, you know, the enemy of my, of my enemy and some, some suddenly becomes my friend. Uh, and so that, that's where it becomes so interesting to understand this. Uh, to me, joint ventures, I could give like a series of, of, of specific sectors. Um, joint venture for mining companies in the energy powering of the company. I and mean, we had into, uh, into this coffee chat probably two or three months ago, we had Nicholas Manling uh, that used to be, I mean, you might know Nicholas, he's also from the Columbia University kind of a, mm. of Galaxy. He's been working a lot with EITI and, and, and out of Norway and now he's actually based in Chile. But for a long time, we've been working with him on, on, on making the case for green powering of mines, which sounds absolutely obvious now. Yeah. Five, six, seven years ago, we were kind of in the middle of the desert just pushing yeah. for the idea. Uh, but that's, that's elements where you can build a joint venture that has positive, you know, return on reputational risk, on operational risk, on domestic risk, on relation with community, the same thing for catering, the same thing for potentially building infrastructure. When I say infrastructure, it could be you know, telecommunication, energy, it could be uh, you know, highways, and all these, obviously it's not the business of the mining company, it's not the business of the energy company, but instead of just arriving saying, look, we're ready to fund this, we pro we're building a foundation, we're putting a big check on your desk, you minister of energy, it's a much better approach to actually hire someone that might have a better understanding on this, you know, whether it's inside a company or outside, to actually be integrated into the, 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 selling, the signing of these joint venture agreements. Because the details are where you make an ally of that member, meaning that you will build that highway together, but let's agree also that you will supply, let's say, cement, or you will do this, and therefore suddenly you're going to see the opposition to the project, you know, cut down of financing and funding because that was the true reasons. Yeah. And so you want to be involved into this. Sorry, I, I, I've talked. No, no, it's, there's no question. I mean, the more local ownership you can create on the ground across the board, uh, you know, the better. It becomes very, very tricky though in terms of as you're saying, Remy. You know, you've got different forces behind the scenes, different economic actors. Um, you know, I think from a legal compliance standpoint, this is where uh, the lawyers have the most heartburn when it comes down to these local joint ventures, local partners, who are the local partners, who's the money really coming from, who's really going to benefit from it, who's the brother of the mayor, all those, all those things that becomes incredibly complicated. But without, without having good people on the ground, understanding those relationships, mapping them out, um, you don't have a chance. You're going to walk into a landmine. But uh, it comes back again to stakeholder engagement, intelligence, understanding of really what's the dynamic on, on the ground. I have a funny story. It's not related to, uh, you know, Africa, but 
when Talisman was working and doing some shale gas kind of um, pilot projects, I guess you could say in Poland back in probably 2008, 2009, um, you know, all of Europe was really much for very much against fracking and, and against shale gas. Poland was one of the only countries in the region that was really eager and supportive of, of gas because of course they wanted to get out from underneath uh, Gazprom. And uh, at the time the, the Poles actually had the, I think the presidency or the commission chair at the EU. So I spent a bit of time in Brussels and uh, you know, I'm not sure they were paranoid or there was really something to it, but they were utterly convinced that the campaign against shale in Europe uh, and specifically in Poland was being funded by 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 Gazprom, and you know if you think about it, it makes it makes utter complete sense. And the sad the sad thing was, this was the one country where the shale pilots didn't work. So unfortunately, you know Chevron, Marathon, Nexen, Talisman, we all had to withdraw. And and uh, I don't know, I'm not sure where they're at these days in terms of gas supply. But uh, yeah, the, the the money can be coming from different angles with all kinds of different purposes. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, the, and I was reading also a, a wonderful question from, from, from John Williams, just a, a little tidbit on, on Poland. I don't know if they just had a presidential elections two weeks ago. And if you look mm -hmm. at Duda, who was being reelected, like Russia was responsible for, for the COVID-19 to, uh, to the absence of, of, uh, of life on Mars. I mean, it was, it was literally, literally everything. That was, that was interesting. But you have to understand, you know, how these geopolitical concerns really shape and frame the narratives and therefore have to be integrated into the way that you different develop uh, operations. We just have less than 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try to dig into you know, the question from John. It's such an interesting question, John, and probably we'll reach out to you afterwards. We did talk about you know, water uh, last week, so that I probably will not focus your question on, on, on water, but mm -hmm. we're looking at especially in terms of, of technological assistance to other sectors next to a, to, to a project, whether mining projects or an energy project, you know, working with agriculture, uh, working with other services uh, to develop collateral economic activity. I do have a very clear idea in mind in the coffee industry, for example. Do you want to bring an example on your side and then probably- Yeah, no, it, I'm, glad, I'm glad John's raised the question because it, it really is something that I really wanted to make a, a point of. You know, I think that, you know, the experience at, at, at Cosmos over the last few years was one where we were really looking for ways to make a better impact locally in the countries like Ghana, where we have had such a long history um, and you know wanting to do more than just say well we have this vocational training institute or that we're paying x amount of royalties to the government in ghana in accra we thought to ourselves why don't we cosmos has always prided itself on thinking outside the box and being a bit of a contrarian and we thought well why don't we try to come up with a flagship approach in terms of our social investments that actually kind of breaks some some of these rules and so we came up with the idea of you know, taking virtually all of our social investment monies that were discretionary in Ghana and putting them into um, what we called the Cosmos Innovation Center, which was an entrepreneurship kind of uh, shark tank type of uh, uh, incubator approach mm -hmm. uh, with its focus on technology and agriculture. You know, you look at Ghana, agriculture was there before oil and gas it will be there well after oil and gas and you know from a from an employment standpoint from a kind of local outreach standpoint agriculture is such an important aspect of you know most important aspect of ghana and so we really tried to create a standalone program where we made we try to make agriculture exciting you know and, and reach out to the local universities the young entrepreneurs and put them into a program where we took them around the country introduce them to people up and down the supply chain in the agricultural sector as to what was working, what the constraints were, gave them all sorts of business training, technology training, had them come up with teams and pitch, you know, a series of judges on their ideas for um, agricultural programs and a lot of app based type uh, programs. Uh, I was part of that. And, and over time, it became incredibly successful. Um, one program became almost like the Uber of tractors in Ghana, where you could bring in you know, kind of mechanize agriculture to small plot farmers in, a, in an aggregated way through, through app use and whatnot, um, to the point that some of these companies have become, you know, valued over a million dollars. And, and we've now exported that approach to, you know, well, I say we, I'm no longer there, but Cosmos uh, exported that approach to Mauritania, to Senegal, even here into the United States. And so the idea was, you know, not just be bound by, by your particular industry, but take the the technology, the entrepreneurship, the things that you think you bring to the table as a company and spur and create catalysts in other aspects of the economy where actually you can have a bigger impact than just saying, well, we're going to, we're going to train X amount of welders. 
Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna kind of try to re revitalize and and create more excitement around the egg sector and bring some innovation to it as well. So it's been a really um, important initiative for the company. I think it's and it's born uh, born some some really great exciting fruit. Yeah, and and if I want to um, reach out also to to the mining sector, it makes sense on, on, on that level. Uh, I mean, first of all, what you're describing in Ghana or in different countries. I mean, all countries are trying battling in front of this, trying to yeah. use and harness extractive industries to create entrepreneurship to create you know diversification of, of the economy i've seen a, a couple of people of, of the attendance that are from qatar so right now and and, and i've seen <laughs> qatar for five years of trying to you know harness with incubators of developing you know diversifying the economy fighting against the resource curse there's plenty yeah. of ways to do this yeah. um you know whether you have a specific trust sovereign wealth fund you can have this we talked about a specific projects in Alberta last week with uh, Harry Redenberg and the uh, reconciliation projects where you have indigenous communities having 51% of, of ownership of the projects and, and a trust that limits, you know, potential resource curse. So that's something that we we'll probably address in, in a future, in a future coffee mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. Specifically on, 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 on mining or in agricultural interests, I don't know if that's where John Williams went to, to go, but we, we see and we advise, for example, uh, a company to sometimes co mining companies, extractive companies do not realize how much with just a little bit they can change or in, impact positively the ecosystem that they run into. And, and the focus, for example, when I said with the coffee industry, it was just about you know, being able to showcase some of the, the mining industry processes in terms of quality control, in terms of basic accounting, you know, accounting processes, in terms of potentially labeling and doing some marketing <clears throat> around the product. Now, all this is obvious to anyone that's a BA in, in, in administrative studies, in business, or, or whichever. And, and they are ingrained into the mining company or the uh, uh, energy company. And just by hosting a series of you know, public uh, consultations and meeting, obviously, it has to be slightly different with COVID now. Mm -hmm. But being able to train those different workers and companies by telling them, look, this is how you're supposed to do your basic accounting. Just spend one hour with the responsible of the accounting of the mining company, yep. and they will run you what they do. This is extremely valuable for the different communities on the side and small different, you know, economic interest. And that gets the alliances of the agricultural sector, the alliances of, of you know, you know, even ecotourism. I'm, I'm thinking of a specific, yeah, specific absolutely. case when you had, we had, you know, uh, hot, the, the uh, tourism sector, the ecotourism sector, you know, financing the opposition to the to, to a mining project, which makes sense. They just don't want to have a mining when they're actually saying, look, come and see the, yeah, uh, the, the countryside. But at, at, at the same time, they just understood that, you know, the presence of the extractive industry actor just shed lights on, on the place, was able to, they were able to use a couple platforms to showcase what they were, you know, proposing in terms of ecotourism, reach out to new clients. So they probably lost the local clients that did not go towards, you know, anymore to that, to, to those, those trips, but they got much more international clients and much more spending clients, to be very honest, to yeah. come to their operations. And they understood how to grow, how to not make errors that anyone does. I mean, I did in first business, and that's completely normal. And, and that's where I'm saying like those bridges between stakeholders and economic stakeholders on very basic elements are very strong to create fostering of understanding that the money industry can be a vector of sustainable development of alternative sector. It's not either or I, it's together if there's better communication and transparency. Absolutely. Kind of like it's already 11.59. Reg, can you actually try to tie this up in 55 Well, seconds? I was going to say, I mean, the other, other aspect I want to add to that is, you know, you just cannot underestimate as well as how empowering that is for your local staff people yep. on the ground you know we saw that in ghana we've seen that all all of our operations where you get your local teams your local accounting people your engineers um to go out and into the community and, and do some of this training um the amount of pride people feel and the amount of uh excitement that is built within your organization as well you can't underestimate uh you know people understanding that their company is taking a bigger picture approach is to understand the broader context and wants to contribute, not just in the dollars and cents and producing a barrel of oil. I mean, I think, I think that's a tie up to this whole thing is understanding your role within the broader society, the broader context and playing an active role where you can it has all kinds of risk management benefits, but also some very positive opportunities, you know, um, for the company's uh, relationship to reputation and, and empowerment of your staff. So, yeah, I mean, recently we've done a little bit pro bono work in, 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 uh, in Brazil, which is the country of origin of authors. Since then, he's actually working night shift. I mean, that's it. That's just a motivation. <laughs> I wanted to end on the, on the stupid joke. Uh, but anyway, uh, guys, it was a pleasure. It wasn't a car wash joke. Sorry? It wasn't a car wash joke, was it? Yeah, actually, he actually invested in a, in a, in a, in a car wash industry. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, I, I hope most of people got, got the joke. If not, just look at Lava Jato Brazil and you'll, you'll understand. Uh, on this, uh, I, we, try to, we pride ourselves in, on ending at the, at the last second. I do realize we just probably covered 10% of what I want to cover with you, Jess. So it's possible that we do another coffee chat in the future or, or topics similar to that on procurement, local content and others. Feel free, as always, to share you know, uh, suggestions. Uh, early in the chat, there was the, the link to the LinkedIn uh, group. Uh, and to some of our you know, content on our website, AMI. So it's in the regular invitation. I added a new direction, a new email address, uh, sorry, a new internet link uh, for some of the uh, you know, AMI content, which I completely forgot to share with you guys in the past. So feel free to click on it and look at the, the invitation that you had for today's chat. There's more information there. And I'm just going to use the last few seconds just to say thank you very much, Reg. I'm looking forward to, to a future coffee chat and conversation and, and potentially a trip to, uh, to, to, to Dallas. I know you're moving, so good luck with the boxes. <laughs> yeah. And, and moving from one house to the next. So uh, thank you very much for everything, guys. Thank you, Reg. And, uh, Thank you, Remy. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the conversation. Do it again. Cheers. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.